Hi, my name is Sarah Sadar. I am an occupational therapist and team coordinator for Centera Reed Therapy Center in Woodbridge, Virginia. Um, for 18 years, I've been practicing occupational therapy uh, with a particular interest in working with adults and for specifically the older population. Uh, one of my interests is ensuring that older adults are able to remain safe in the community. Uh, and so I'd love to talk to you today about balance and fall prevention so we can help our older population remain safe in their own homes in the community. So today we're gonna talk about balance and falls in the aging population. So let's talk a little bit about who falls. Have you ever fallen or do you know someone who's fallen in the last year? I bet if I were to take a poll, uh, I could probably have most people raise their hands um, to say that either they had fallen or knew someone who had fallen within the past year. The reason I ask that is because one of the biggest risk factors of having a fall is already having had one within the past six months. So let's talk a little bit about statistics and facts surrounding falls in the community and particularly in the older population. So if you think about, um, for example, the proportion of Americans over the age of 65, how many do we think experiences a fall every year? Well, according to the National Council on Aging, about a third of Americans over 65 falls every year. That's a large proportion. Those falls don't necessarily always lead to injury, but given that that simply, that act of having had that fall can increase your risk of a future fall, there's definitely things that we want to do to mitigate that risk in the future. So what do we think is the leading cause of fatal injury and most common cause of non-fatal trauma related to hospital admissions in older adults? Well, falls unfortunately are the leading cause of fatal injury and the most common cause of non-fatal trauma related hospital admissions among older adults. And unfortunately, the proportion of older individuals that informs their physicians of a fall is less than half. What proportion of falls causes a serious injury like broken bones and head injury? When we look at serious injuries like broken bones, about one in five falls causes a serious injury. And if you fall once, your chances double of falling again. So what kind of things can cause a fall? Is it just because we're getting older? Well, in a way, but not completely. Falls can occur due to accumulation of risk factors that can arise from many aspects of your life and overall health. The risk factors can be classified in some different categories. So we can think about physical risk factors, behavioral and lifestyle risk factors, as well as environmental risk factors. So let's look at those a little bit more closely. When it comes to physical risk factors, as we age, our body continues to develop, and sometimes that can develop chronic ailments that can have negative impacts on how we walk or our gait or on our balance. The organization Health and Aging put together a list of common physical risk factors for falls as we age. So you can see some physical risk factors here, and I'm sure you'll recognize some common ones, things that you might either have yourself or have a close friend or loved one who has, particularly things like arthritis, chronic pain, diabetes, things like thyroid disorders, foot disorders, those kinds of things are very prevalent in our community among the older population. When we look at lifestyle and behavioral risk factors, based on how we participate in private in our own homes, as well as in community activities, we can develop other risk factors that can compound those already existing risks for falls. A lot of these factors are within their control, though not sometimes all of them. When we think about lifestyle and behavioral risk factors, one of the things to consider is the adverse effects of prescribed medications. If you look at potential side effects on your bottles of medication, sometimes you'll see things like dizziness or drowsiness. And certainly the more medications we take, the more those side effects can be compounded. We can also think about the negative effects stemming from physical inactivity. So as we age, sometimes we have those ailments like arthritis or diabetes or chronic pain. And unfortunately that can lead to us becoming a little less active from a physical standpoint. And that can kind of snowball into further weakness, further inactivity and increased fall risk. So sometimes these things can involve personal lifestyle choices or results from those extrinsic risk factors that cause pain, balance impairments and visual impairments. 
When we think about environmental risk factors, the environmental risk factors typically include how your home is set up or your environment. So even though you're pretty familiar with your home, most falls actually happen inside the home. Falls can happen because of things as simple as a slippery floor that's been mopped and hasn't been, you haven't waited for it to dry. If you have a dimly lit area, so you're getting up and going to the bathroom in the middle of the night. Sometimes loose rugs that can be a tripping hazard, certainly clutter on the floor or on stairs. Sometimes when we're carrying heavy or bulky items up or downstairs, or if we have stairs that don't have railings or do not have grab bars in our bathroom. So environmental risk factors can be considered extrinsic. They're not something that stems from our body. They arise from outside of the body. And in reality, people's physical activity can often be dependent on their environment and vice versa. So these factors are very interrelated. So if you think, for example, someone who doesn't have a railing on their stairs, and so they're afraid to go up and down, and so they limit that activity, you can see how those intrinsic and extrinsic risk factors might be related. So what can we do about this? What can we do to prevent a fall? Well, one of the simplest things that you can do is look at your physical environment. Look at the environment in your home, even though it's quite familiar, but look at it with a really discriminating eye to ensure any environmental risk factors are minimized. So if you have any tripping hazards, like rugs, certainly throw rugs, either secure them or just remove them altogether. Increasing light, lighting in dimly lit areas, especially on stairs and hallways, again, thinking about that pathway from wherever your bedroom is to the bathroom in the dimly lit hours of the morning or the middle of the night or just before bedtime, having a light or a switch close by where you can turn on a light can go a long way to prevent a fall. Installing grab bars in the showers, near the toilet, or particularly handrails on the stairs or entrances to the home, and making sure to clean up spills or other causes of slippery floors immediately. So you've done your due diligence, kind of gone through your checklist and fall-proofed your home. Um, you've taken a look at, made sure you've, you've removed excess clutter from narrow hallways, either removed or secured any throw rugs. There's no cords in your path. So now what else can you do now that you've made your environment a little bit more safe? Well, one of the things you can do is talk to your physician if you're concerned about medication side effects. So we talked about how sometimes those side effects can include blurred vision, dizziness, drowsiness, um, weakness, fatigue. So having a conversation, particularly with your primary care physician, can be really important because when you were taking those medications, you wanna ensure that everything that you're taking is absolutely necessary and one medication is not gonna exacerbate the effect of another. Certainly ensuring you're eating a well-balanced diet and drinking plenty of water. A lot of people don't associate fluid intake with a risk of falls, but when we're dehydrated, we're feeling more fatigued, our muscles aren't working as well, and that can contribute to fall risk. Certainly consulting a physical therapist who's well-practiced in gait and balance and falls to determine what specific exercises or functional training you might require to help improve your safety and independence with all of your daily activities. And you can also consult an occupational therapist who's trained to assess individual environments and activities that you do on a regular basis. So they can provide you with education and training about how best to do these activities in the safest way possible. So what might seeing a physical therapist involve? What does a physical therapist do? I think a lot of the time we just think of physical therapists as, oh, I strained my back and I went to see a PT or I had a knee or a hip replacement and that's what a physical therapist is there for. Well, we have physical therapists that are also specialists in gait or walking and balance. So when you see a physical therapist because you're concerned for fall risk, they'll go through a number of steps. So we'll take a thorough history of your current and past medical conditions. They'll evaluate and examine all kinds of different aspects of your balance and gait to determine an individualized plan of care. So there are standardized assessments that they can look at that can help determine what your risk of falling is. And then they can tailor a plan of exercise and activity to help decrease that risk. Looking at different aspects of a physical therapy evaluation, they're gonna do a gait assessment. So they'll see how you're walking, 
They'll look for any abnormalities that could be negatively impacting your balance. They'll look at your balance when you're standing still or your static balance. And they'll also look at your dynamic balance or balance when you're moving around doing things like reaching and shifting your weight. They'll certainly check your strength in your arms, your legs, your trunk. We also want to know about sensation. If you're uh, having numbness in your feet or a disrupted sense of body awareness, this can often cause a fall. Um, particularly when you're looking at things like diabetic neuropathy um, or other conditions that might decrease your sensation. We're also going to look at something called your vestibular system. Your vestibular system is basically your inner ear's way of telling where your body is in space. So if you're having feelings of dizziness or imbalance or sensations of vertigo, that can greatly reduce your safety and increase your fall risk. And then they'll also see how well you can perform specific tasks. Can you go from sitting down to standing up? Can you do it pushing up from a chair? Can you do it without holding on and pushing up? Can you get on and off the floor? Can you bend and pick up objects from the floor or go up and down stairs? If you see an occupational therapist, what might that involve? And sometimes you can see an occupational therapist in the home. Sometimes we'll see an occupational therapist in an outpatient setting. But similar to physical therapy, we always want to take a thorough medical history. But there are a few differences. Oftentimes, occupational therapists will ask about your activities of daily living, including things that you have to do, as well as things that are meaningful and that you want to do. So things like taking a shower safely, being able to get dressed safely, but also being able to go out into the community and participate in leisure tasks and activities. So we'll look at the context in which you perform those activities and try to determine what would be safest for you based on your individual physical capabilities and functions. So an occupational therapy evaluation can have some similarities and some differences from a physical therapy evaluation. While we certainly look at physical functioning, we're gonna take a closer look at things that we call activities of daily living. So as I mentioned before, bathing, dressing, grooming, getting to the bathroom, instrumental activities of daily living, which can include meal preparation, getting to the grocery store, managing laundry, as well as leisure activities. So what keeps you fulfilled and what keeps you purposeful and active? We'll look at your physical capabilities, but also your um, functional capabilities. So how well can you perform those specific tasks, those ADLs and instrumental activities of daily living, as well as your environment. So sometimes even if you've done a safety check of your home, there are things here and there that are contributing to fall risk that you've missed. And so an occupational therapist can really look at your environment with a discriminating eye and help you determine those things. At Centera Therapy Center, we do have a specific program that's geared towards uh, fall reduction within the community, and it's called the SAFE program. It has the added benefit of a researched and validated exercise program that's based on your individual skill level and fall risk and involves quarterly follow-up appointments to assess for any changes in balance or fall risk. So to get involved in the SAFE program, the first thing that happens is a physical therapy evaluation, and that's when they do a series of standardized assessments to determine what your fall risk is and tailor a program for you. So you may be able to get a referral from your doctor, but physical therapists in Virginia also have direct access, which means that you don't necessarily need a doctor's prescription for an initial evaluation. Certainly going through your physician, particularly if you've had a previous fall, is highly recommended. If you do have a fall, we recommend that you contact your physician so that they know about it. But if it's something that you're simply concerned about and you wanna get evaluated for, you can see a physical therapist without a doctor's prescription just for that initial initial evaluation. Beyond that evaluation, the doctor would have to sign off on your plan of care in order to continue treatment. During your initial evaluation, a physical therapist performs a series of standardized assessments. They'll determine what level of exercise you continue to do on your own. And you might learn these exercises pretty quickly on your first session, or you may need a couple of sessions in order to teach you to perform them properly. Once you've got that initial set of exercises down, your homework is to go home and do them on a regular basis. And then after about three months, you return for a reassessment to determine if the exercises are still appropriate for you or if anything needs to be modified. So at that three month mark, they'll repeat those same standardized assessments that they did on your initial evaluation and determine if there's some changes in your 
scores. The nice thing about this program, as I mentioned before, is that it is researched and well validated. So through studies at Johns Hopkins University, they found that participating in this program does result in a fall risk reduction in older adults. And so what might some of these exercises look like? Well, these exercises, again, are individually tailored to you. And in just a few minutes, I can do a little demonstration for you of several of the exercises that you might learn how to do when you come for a physical therapy evaluation. If you have any questions, certainly give us a call at Centera Therapy Center. We'd be happy to get you set up for an evaluation so that we can help reduce your fall risk and keep you safe in your home. So your exercise program will always be individually tailored to you based on the assessment that your physical therapist does. Those exercises will address your whole body from head to toe. So there might be leg exercises, there might be some arm exercises, or even some neck and some trunk exercises. One example of an exercise that we give our patients is simply raising your head up and down, so extending your neck and flexing. Another example is what we call cervical rotation, which basically just means turning your head from side to side. When it comes to posture in the spine, your body is all connected. So when it comes to strengthening and decreasing fall risk, we wanna make sure that we're addressing the whole body. Another exercise that might be beneficial to you is some trunk rotation or mid-back rotation. That can involve crossing your arms and rotating your body from one side to the other. These exercises might seem awfully simple, and if they do, we might tailor a program that was a little bit more challenging, or these exercises might be just right for you to get your body moving in the way that it needs to decrease your fall risk.